I am Surite. I have come to talk to you about my personal experiences with regard to a topic known as Vedanta philosophy. I am not a philosopher and I am not also a kind of a monk that you can see from my outfit. I am a professor of mathematics of Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, Illinois. At present, I am in Texas teaching at South University in the Department of Mathematics. I do not teach Vedanta philosophy. Therefore, you are wondering that what I will be discussing with regard to this particular philosophical topic, which often is known as the very uh, fundamental, the core of Hindu religion. First of all, I must tell you about my personal experience, how I got involved into this philosophy. I was, when I was young, I was very much interested in mathematics. I wanted to know logic. I heard a lot from my parents about God, that God is good, that God loves everybody, God is very kind. But I saw in Calcutta miseries amongst children, little children. They are born without food, they are born without clothes, and at the same time I saw a lot of rich people. They are riding nice cars and so on. And I asked myself, if there is a God who is supposed to be so kind, why he is so unkind to these children? I got no answer. My parents, especially my mom, said, do not ask this question. I thought it is better to spend money to save these hungry children, to feed them, to send them to school, to give them better medications than worshipping gods and goddesses. Then I came to know the science of Hindu philosophy lies in what is called the Vedas and Vedas lead to Vedanta. I wanted to know what this is all about. Vedas means knowledge, books of knowledge. And Vedanta literally means the end of knowledge. I could not accept that because I understood there cannot be an end to any knowledge. I remember Isaac Newton said, I'm standing on the seashore collecting just pebbles. In front of me lies the vast ocean of knowledge about which I know very little. Though we know very little how there could be an end of the knowledge. Though I saw so many contradictions. I attended some classes with my parents sometimes. The monks came and talked about Vedanta philosophy. Honestly, I understood nothing. I was then a teenager and I was just finishing my high school going into college. I attended many other lectures by university professors giving lectures on Vedanta. Honestly, I tell you, I understood nothing. I understood that this is just a bunch of philosophical tenets, philosophical mandates that people want to talk about without understanding what really it means. Because nobody could explain and I could not ask any question. Especially when the monks came and they talked about Vedanta philosophy and I wanted to ask questions. My mom asked me not to ask questions, just to accept all that they are saying. That is against my principle. If I think if that is so, then there will be no progress of science, no progress in mathematics. We must ask questions. We must know why. And to me, if there exists a knowledge, that knowledge must be understood not by a handful of persons, but by many. And I wanted to be one of those many. With that idea in view, I came to find out from my friends that if I do Brahmacharya, which means if I follow certain regulation which mostly the monks follow, then I will be able to understand what Vedanta philosophy means. I decided to do Brahmacharya and that was the turning point of my life. 
All my questions finally were answered. I got answers not from the teachers but from within. The teachers asked me that before you even study Vedanta philosophy, there are certain things that you have to do. You have to learn how to do meditation, but you cannot learn meditation unless you learn how to do certain yogas. And I asked, what's the purpose for all these yoga? They said, yogas are not to keep body fit, but to understand how the system of the body works, all the organs of the body work, what food to eat, what food not to eat, how we can take care of every organ of the body. And they said, you cannot go ahead and eat any food you want to. You cannot associate with all kinds of people. There must be certain restrictions. And I started following all the restrictions because I wanted to know what lies inside the philosophy. The first interesting point that they made is there's a sloka, and I'm reciting that sloka. It says, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Eva Vashishyate. I asked them, what is the meaning of that? They said, it means there exists an infinite, invisible, complete universe. Out of that universe, another visible, complete universe, which is also infinite, came out. Although this new universe came out, the other universe remained unchanged. And they said, you know this from the principle of mathematics. If from the infinite, if you take infinite out, the result will be infinite. And why, I said, why it is complete? They said, because all the information that you need to know, the whole world needs to know, all information must be there. And that also was very mystic to me. What do you mean by all information was there? Then they explained. They explained that the source out of which everything is coming, the whole universe came out from that source. I said, how? They said, science says it was a Big Bang, and Vedanta says this is Hiranyagarbha. What is Hiranyagarbha? I asked. They said, Hiranyagarbha means the, the golden ohm, means out of huge fire. And I found, yes, science also accepts that. And that was an interesting point for me to look into this. Then I said, is there any way to reach that state of understanding that that source exists? They said, the source exists in you. And I said, is that source the one that we worship as gods and goddesses? They said, no. They said, in Isha Upanishad, there's a mandate. And the mandate says, you should not worship gods and goddesses. You rather concentrate on yourself and when you concentrate on yourself then and only then you will realize the truth. Well, I was happy but I was not happy at the same time. Question is how to concentrate? They taught me meditation. They said this is the way you can do it. But in order to do meditation you have to re remember all the mandates. Mandate one is you cannot go out and eat food anywhere you want to. You cannot associate with all kinds of people, your friends, especially girlfriends, because your mind will be deviated. Many, many information you will, you will get from them and you will start processing. Your mind will be shattered into pieces, will be distracted from meditation. So you have to stop that. And I did that. For four years, I conducted strictly what is called the principles of Brahma Jarja. After that, I learned my concentration, I understood. My mind was not moving here and there. 
and through meditation once in the afternoon by the side of the Ganges when my teacher was with me I went into a state and I cannot describe what that state was. It is indescribable. Everything I wrote in a book and that book is published by the Rurik Society of Lithuania and the book the name of the book is Vedanta the science of consciousness and divinity. Now I'll go back in time a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit about what was the point of attraction for me when I was a student, you know, searching for the truth. And that is my book called The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It was very attractive to me. But few things I could not understand. Sri Ramakrishna said that everything is divine. Vedanta says, Sarvam Kalidam Brahman. I asked myself, what is Brahman? I asked people, what is Brahman? My father said, Brahman is God. Vedanta says, Pragyanam Brahman. That means your consciousness is Brahman. How, what do you mean by consciousness? I asked myself. How can I know that everything is conscious? Suddenly chairs and tables are not conscious. And how do I know that consciousness means everything is divine? Brahman means something which is divine. Are evil people divine? Vedanta says, Sarvam Kalidam Brahma means everything is divine. Evil people are divine. When I heard that in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, I tell you the truth. I decided not to read this book any farther. I can accept a cup is divine. I can accept the statue of a goddess is divine. I can accept if a building is divine, but I cannot accept an evil person who kills little children, an evil person who is a rapist, an evil person who steals other food is also a divine person. I cannot accept that. He cannot be divine. Therefore there are contradictions, but all these contradictions ended. On that day in July, when I went into deep meditation and started seeing lights, stream of lights all around me, my voice was getting choked, my brain was getting choked, my mind could not move any farther. And I realized that there is some truth coming and grasping me and I got completely lost. After that state, I really found that light is everywhere. Everything is light. Everything is holy. In a dirt is holy. Ganges is a flow of holy stream of light. All people, regardless where I see, everywhere light exists. Question is, is there a proof? Can that be proved? I started wondering. I thought maybe it cannot be proved. And I heard that other people had exactly the same kind of vision. I started wondering, is this vision that other people have and the vision that I have, are they seeming the same? I asked my teachers. I talked to them all. They said, don't worry about it. All the answers will come from within. Then you will understand that whatever is happening with you is nothing new. It happened to others too. Then what do you mean by saying that a 
but who is evil, he is also divine. They said, you stop thinking of that. The moment you think of that, your mind is distracted from what you already experienced. And of course this took time. It did not happen almost immediately. It took almost uh, about, I should say, four or five months before, before I started thinking of all those things. Anyway, I started giving talks about that. But then my mind got more involved as a student, got more involved in my academics. At least I understood that whatever pe people are doing may not be all that stupid but thing that I used to know. There may be some truth, they are worshipping the same person whom I saw in my vision. The same person, same light, same, because it's written everywhere that that is light, that is light, that is light. In Sri Sri Chandi, I saw that mother was described as a, a ball of fire about light. Light was present everywhere. But my, but my inquiry is that whether it could be proved scientifically or not, that remains in the, in the dark. And after that, I got more involved in mathematics. I got more involved into doing things which I enjoyed doing. And these questions suddenly didn't bother me anymore until I met Swami Sadarandaji. I was then working at NASA Ames Research Center in California, near San Jose. And Swami Sadarandaji, he was the head monk of Sacramento Center of the Vedanta Society and he knew me since I was a child and he visited me, I was with my wife and two children and he asked me about the definition of mathematics and when he heard from me what do I mean from mathematics he said this is Vedanta and he stuck in my mind that the truth could be explained in terms of mathematical equation. Is that possible? He gave me encouragement, a lot of encouragement. He said, go for it. But I was busy working at NASA, giving lectures at Stanford and other universities, working at Berkeley. Therefore, I did not have much time. But I started wondering, is there a proof? Honestly, I could not find that proof. I tried and I failed. When I went to Calcutta, one of my friends, who was my friend when I was doing Brahma Chacha, he I met him accidentally and he asked me, could you prove that Brahman exists? Don't talk about that. Everybody talks about that. Everybody just makes a discussion about that. You are a mathematician. You are not a monk. You are not a sannyasi. You should prove it just the way a mathematician does. Can you prove it? When I came back to the United States, I came back home. We lived during that time in Charleston, Illinois. I came back to Charleston. I left my job at NASA. My job was at Charleston, Illinois as a math professor. And I was also working at Argonne National Lab in Chicago. And Dr. Tony Polycaster, he was my colleague at Argonne, he said, how can he prove? It almost like a proof that God exists. How can he prove that God exists mathematically? He said, it is impossible to prove to it. Just ignore their question. But the questions did not leave me. I started thinking. I already told people about my experience. How come 
I cannot explain this experience in terms of mathematics. If I cannot explain, people will not buy my words. I'm not a Guruji, I'm not a sannyasi, I'm not a monk. Therefore, if I talk about that, people will ask me, you experience, how do I know that you have experience? How do I know that you can prove that this experience exists? You have to prove in front of us and prove in terms of the language of mathematics, which is the universal language. It was a great headache. In 1996, I was a visiting professor in the University of Valencia and I visited a small village of Spain and that name of the small village is La Iliana and my friend Dr. Lucas Joder who was my colleague from the Department of Mathematics of the University of Valencia he took me to La Iliana to his home he called it a chalet and he asked me and my wife that why don't you live in this chalet for a few days because I have I was supposed to go to Rome to give a series of lectures also. In that chalet, I could not think of my lectures at Rome. I started thinking, is there a proof? And the proof came to me. I do not want to talk about my mystic experience, but I tell the whole world. My profession is Mr. Galadhar Chatterjee, whose other name is Sri Ramakrishna. I got a proof, a solid mathematical proof that absolute exists. When you go into meditation and the proof is done just the way I experience, when you go into meditation, mind releases information one after another. And as mind releases information, these information are all worldly information. All worldly, all information connected about your friends, about your teaching, about your research, about you know places that you visit, about the lectures that you give, about your students, about your colleagues about your brothers, sister, mother, father, friends, relatives, all these things. But as you go into meditation, these informations slowly leave your mind. How? We don't know, but the process exists. You can try and you can validate all by yourself. As mind releases all information, that may be called the principle of neti neti means not this, not this. Mind releases information one after another, one after another. Material information slowly keep on almost like vanishing. And then mathematical equation shows that mind gets stuck with one information which mind cannot change. What is that information? Mind can change every material information, every information coming out from nature. You name any information, you think, my, my friends ask me, how can you change the information? One plus one equal to two. He's a math profession. His name is Dr. Charles Denman. He's at Eastern Illinois University now. He asked me, Sarit, how can you change this info? How your mind can change that information? That one plus one equal to two. I said, Charles, I'll answer. When you see one plus one equal to two, then that two reminds you that you have two children. Then the two children reminds you, your daughter asked for this doll that you didn't buy yet. Or your son asks for this little car that you did buy. When you think of this car, they say, well, that, that car is the model of a Mercedes. 
I should drive a Mercedes. It's a beautiful car. It's a German-made car. No problem. Then you think of, oh, I was in Germany. Your mind goes from one information to another information. Therefore, one plus one equal to two vanishes from your mind. That's how mind produces information. If memory cannot store that information, you cannot tell people what you have experienced. Because in the memory, that information is no longer there. Then when I read the, in, in, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, that, that when people asked him about Brahman, he said, a doll of of salt wanted to measure the depth of the ocean. The moment the doll entered into the ocean, it got melted immediately. How can the doll will tell you how deep is the ocean? Then I understood. Yes, mind cannot information, process information, means the, the memory cannot store that information, means you cannot tell people what that information is all about. Then how about that light? Is that light a reality or that was something that my mind produced a light? When I read the book, it's written by James Austin. The name of the book is Zen and the Brain. Then Dr. Austin mentioned exactly the same thing. That I'm not the only one. He did a research and found about, I don't remember, about 330 people. 11% of them said that they saw light during meditation. The next question, before this happened, I felt tremendous amount of pleasure. I felt as if this happiness is a never-ending happiness. No one will take away this happiness from me. Is that something that is almost like the effect of a drug? Then I saw that Dr. Robert Ornstein wrote in the book, and the name of the book is The Healing Brain. And he discussed that during meditation, when meditation goes to a deeper state, then the brain releases certain spatial neurotransmitters. One of them is engaphelin, the other is endorphin. And of course, I found that Dr. James Austin mentioned the same thing. That produces in your body a tremendous amount of feeling of deep happiness. The happiness came into your mind automatically, which means that helped your mind to release all information, to go to the abode of peace, to go to that abode of happiness, to feel that I am free at last. I do not have to be worried anymore. All worries can be put aside. In my book, I wrote all my personal experiences and quoted from various parts of Vedanta philosophy. All these things which I'm telling you in a more concrete, in a more direct, in a more easy way, like discussion type, as if I'm discussing with you, sitting next to you. And I had many questions from my students. Everywhere I went, people asked me questions after questions after questions. Sometimes I felt they wanted to validate whether my experience is just a true experience or it is just the way I just thought it was my experience. But when I said that you can have that experience again and again and again, almost any time, any time. But in order to have that experience, you must learn the art of meditation. You must know how to enjoy loneliness. I enjoyed my loneliness. Unless you are lonely, unless you are alone, unless you are all by yourself, you won't be able to do what is called meditation. 
It is difficult because when you are surrounded by people, you interact with people and you get involved with all kinds of discussion rather than searching in your mind. I also understood one truth, you know, when I first heard, you know, studied from Biodar and the Upanishad, that it is that state when the father is no longer a father, mother is no longer a mother, Veda is no longer Veda. When I first read, I did not understand a bit. But when I found the truth, especially proving mathematically, I understood that if the Absolute is real, at that point there cannot be a father. Because if there is a father, there must be a son. Means two information. Two information cannot exist, then your brain can process it and pass from the father to the son. Therefore the information could be changed. Dualism comes in. Therefore it must be it must be the fact that at that point father can the concept of father, concept of the Vedas, concept of gods and goddesses, nothing can exist because your mind is stuck in one principle, in one thought in one particular in information. I request all of you, I urge you, those who are interested to study scientifically the truth of Vedanta, I request you to read the book. I'm not saying you read only this book, there are other authors. I'm pretty sure those authors are superior to me. You well, I mean, you are welcome. You should read their books too. But many of my friends, mostly my students, very young, they are enjoying reading my book. Therefore, I think if you read my book, feel free to write to me. Feel free to criticize me. Do not hesitate. Feel free to ask me open questions. If you find any logic which you think is improper, but I tell you, my friends, I'm telling you that this book is based upon many of the scientific articles which I wrote in 1997. My first article came out, which I began writing in La Eliana in that little Spanish village and that article, the name of that article is Analysis of Consciousness in Vedanta Philosophy that appeared in Informatica, that's an international journal on computer science. My second article on this topic came out from Cybernetica and that is also a journal in computer science and information processing. My third article, which is mostly purely mathematical article, came out from Berkeley, the Noetic Journal, and there are many talks I gave in many countries, not just in one country. Therefore, I welcome you to look into these journals if you are more interested in mathematics. But my book, in my book, I certainly did write too much mathematics because I thought that if I do that, some people, they may be, you know, done, done bad. They may think, oh, this is a mathematical book. I'm not interested. It is a book for everybody. I tell you that if you read and if you make your comments, I will welcome your comments. Have a wonderful day. Have a blessed life and Namaste.